Hi everybody, Doc Mackey here. Sorry I couldn't be with you in person. I'm away at a conference giving a couple lectures this week, but so next best thing I guess is video. Uh, we're gonna have someone here to answer questions for you during the week uh, in between this uh, lecture series. This will be pretty quick. It's three topics. First topic is nasal and tidal CO2. Second topic is Ketorolac or Toradol. Third one is a burn treatment called 20CRW. All three of these roll out on February 1st. Okay, let's start with nasal and tidal CO2. If you've used this before, maybe in private industry or if you've been in 20s or 13s in the last month or so, we've had this equipment and we've been playing with it a little bit and we're pleased with how it's performed. Nasal and tidal CO2 has some functioning parts. It looks and acts just like a nasal cannula, okay? It wears like a nasal cannula except it has this cup that hangs down in front that is designed to pick up CO2. If you look at the tubing, one side of the tubing is pretty thin, one side of the tubing is pretty thick. On the other end are two connecting devices. You'll look at this, and you'll recognize it right off the bat. This is like we normally screw into our entitled CO2 adapter on our monitor. It functions exactly the same way. It'll give you waveforms and it'll give you numbers to measure entitled CO2. The other end of this has a nasal or has an oxygen adapter. You do not have to use this in order to use this. All right, you can use this if you want to add more oxygen, but you don't have to. For this thing to function, for entitled CO2, you only need this part, okay? So it has the same connector for entitled CO2 like we use for intubation currently. And just a quick reminder of what the waveform looks like. Remember when the person breathes in, the waveform drops. As they exhale, it rises. So the very first upstroke is them breathing out. At the end of exhalation, that's the end tidal CO2. That's that blue dot right there that we're measuring. And as you breathe in, the waveform goes back down. So just a quick review of what the waveform is. All right, so on our monitors though, you'll see you'll get this waveform just like we normally do with intubated patients. And you get a number, which is the end tidal CO2, the big 38 that's sitting right there. But you get another number, which you may have paid to paid attention to before, is that small number, that 12 that's right there, that's their actual respiratory rate. So you can get an actual respiratory rate when you're using this, which is very handy, I think. So let's talk through some physiology, all right? Just like anything that combusts produces a gas, our bodies have internal combustion chambers called mitochondria, as you can see right here. As those combustion chambers become more active, think of a fever, think of a seizure, think of someone who ran a couple miles. As those, as those combustion chambers become active, they chew up sugar and the byproduct is CO2. So when that CO2 travels through our blood to our lungs, where well, we breathe it out and we can measure it. So, I want to describe this physiology in a way so you can kind of wrap your brain around how the system would break. So just like a shipping yard is like our cells, the busier the shipping yard, the more shipping containers are moving, the more CO2 is being produced. We load that in our bloodstream onto trucks, our red blood cells, and we transport it through our blood vessels until we get back to our lungs where we unload it and then we measure the CO2 that came from way back in the shipping yard. We measure it at the, at the loading docks where they're unloading the CO2. That is the end tidal CO2. So it kind of gives you a second to second, minute to minute kind of measure of what's really happening down at the cellular level. That's why I really like these is because it gives you some really good indication about how sick your patient is and when they're getting worse, when they're getting better. All right, so let's transition to just numbers. Just think of the number, not the waveform. So that 38, remember the 38 we looked at a little bit ago? Think of that 38, okay? So let's look at when these numbers become abnormal. Number one in my mind is sepsis. So with sepsis, thinking about that shipping yard, trucks, blood vessel kind of system, right? Think about in sepsis. So in sepsis, our combustion chambers are on overdrive, right? The body is sick chewing up a lot of sugar, producing a lot of CO2, loading up our bloodstream, that CO2 
trying to get back to our lungs, but in sepsis, there's really poor perfusion. And that poor perfusion is reflected in the amount of CO2 that actually gets to the lungs that is exhaled. So in this system, it's our freeway system that's broken. Everything's clogged up, everything is moving slower, perfusion is poor, and therefore the CO2 that actually is getting into our lungs after we initially are over breathing because we're septic is low. So the answer to the question for abnormal numbers for entitled CO2 is anything that is abnormal that we are gonna be thinking about is lower. The number should be low. Now remember, normal is 35 to 45. So we're looking for numbers in the low 20s, high teens. Those patients are gonna be exceptionally sick and you're gonna see it on your monitor. And when you begin treatment, you'll see those numbers get better and change. So let's look at a real case here. So this is a case that Engine 20 had. It was a 101 year old, right? And had some urinary symptoms, was very confused. So Glasgow coma score was seven, blood pressure was 116 systolic, tacking away at 135, respiratory was 35, right? Clear lung sounds, but look at that CO2. This end tidal CO2 was 14. 14 and this is an actual waveform from that patient. You can see that those numbers are ticking along and they're at 14, which makes me wanna pause and point something very important out to you. Look at the blue line, remember that measures oxygen saturation. That corresponds with pulse. So our heart rate and, and SpO2 are gonna match. Do not expect the end tidal CO2 to match anything other than the respiratory rate. So this person was breathing 35 times a minute and had an end tidal CO2 of 14 in sepsis from a urinary tract infection. Now, let's say like we started to treat the patient, we recognize the sepsis, our protocols call for 500 cc bolus, pause, blood pressure, lungs, repeat. So in the, in the event of someone who is in septic shock, you'll start to actually see these numbers get better. The entitled CO2 may actually improve because you're helping the freeway system move along better to get back to the lungs to off-gas the CO2. Okay, let's transform our conversation a little bit and let's move away from the numbers and let's move toward the waves. I want, now we're thinking waves, not the numbers, all right? Look at this graphic. On the very left-hand side of the graphic is a normal end tidal CO2 waveform. Do you see it's kind of sharp up slope, levels off, sharp down slope. But is someone with CO, think of COPD, asthma, emphysema, something obstructive that's causing them to have a harder time breathing because they're wheezing, their lungs are tight, they can't get air in, right? That first upstroke of the wave gets a little bit cut off. It starts to slant a little bit. And the reason for that is because of that obstruction that they're experiencing in their airways. It causes the wave to look abnormal and it looks like a shark fin. So when they're severely obstructed, that end tidal CO2 waveform looks like a shark fin. Now, as you put them on CPAP or you start treatment, that waveform will likely start to get a little bit more flat and the upstroke will get a little bit more steep and you'll see it happen right in front of your own eyes. Which causes me to ask the question, you're probably all wondering, wait, can I use these both together? So yeah, remember, this wears like a nasal cannula. It wears like a nasal cannula. You put it on like a nasal cannula and you can put your CPAP right over the top of it. And so with your CPAP over the top of this, and you're only connecting this in your entitled CO2 adapter, right? You're gonna get the CO2 waveform. You also get numbers and respiratory rate, but you don't necessarily have to use the oxygen side of it. You can use that through your CPAP, okay? So that's where this is gonna be really useful. Think of that real severe distress. So let's, let's look at uh, patient engine 13 had. 62 year old guy, short of breath, history of COPD, has been innovated before, two to three word sentences. In your mind right now, you're seeing maybe a patient you've seen within the last month that is exactly like this. And they went ahead and put the patient on CPAP, they had the entitled CO2 on, they started albuterol, 
and the patient's waveforms looked like this. Look at these waveforms over here toward the left-hand side. Do you see this kind of really kind of gradual upslope? It's not that steep upslope. That's what I'm talking about. And as they progress through their treatment, the, the steepness of that slope got a little bit steeper. And so they weren't slurring so much to get up to the entitled CO2. They're actually much steeper to, to platform off. And the patient started to improve significantly. And they saw it happen right in front of their eyes. Okay. So that covers uh, end tidal CO2. We're gonna take a break right here because I'm sure some of you may have questions and we have someone in the room that's gonna be able to answer those questions for me, so take it away. Okay, let's cover the next topic. This is gonna to be about Ketorolac or Toradol. If you've ever had this medication before given to you, I want you to think about if you could crush up Motrin and put it into an injectable form, that's what this drug is. It is very simple to give. It is a single dose. It's a non-narcotic pain medication and it'd be given IM or IV. I wanna make a suggestion to you, I would definitely give this drug IM. All right, it's a single dose, can be given IM. You don't have to go through the worry about starting an IV. Just caution your patient that it may burn a little bit because it does burn for about 15 or 20 seconds. So. Key points, it's pain medication. It's basically injectable Motrin. It's a single dose. For adults, it's 15 milligrams if you're gonna give it IV or IO. And if you're gonna give it IM, it's 30 milligrams. And if you remember what that bottle looked like, 30 milligrams per CC is how it comes. So you're in adults, you're either giving half the bottle if it's IV, whole bottle if it's IM, okay? And finally, it can be given in kids as well. I personally have never given it in kids. It's not that you can't. Uh, but uh, it's not it's not contraindicated in kids. All right, here's the big part. Just like TX8 has several contraindications, which is unfortunate, but I'm gonna try to break it down to three, all right? Respiratory, anticoagulation, and kidney disease. All right, so first thing, if they are wheezing, all right, you can't give it to them because it makes the wheezing worse. All right, second thing is bleeding. If they're on Coumadin or Warfarin, if they're on Eliquis, if they're on Pradax, or something that thins their blood, not aspirin, but something else that thins their blood, you can't give it for that. It's got a theoretical risk to actually make the blood even thinner. And then the big one is kidney disease. So the dialysis patient is probably the easiest one to think of, but I want you to also think about how to ask this question in a way that the patient will be able to answer the information you're trying to get at. So ask the patient this question. Has a doctor ever told you that your kidneys may not be healthy? All right, so that doesn't mean kidney stones, but people who have got long-standing high blood pressure, long-standing diabetes, and their kidneys are starting to get sick, this drug can actually make their kidneys sicker. So we don't wanna make, we don't wanna give them the drug. So wheezing, anticoagulation, except for aspirin, and kidney disease. And of course, if they have allergies to the drug, that's gonna be a no-brainer, right? So if they're allergic to Motrin or allergic to Naproxen, you can't give it for them, and pregnant patients. Okay, beyond all that, so what I want you to think about, mild to moderate pain, think back pain, chronic back pain, flank pain like a kidney stone, gallbladder disease, something along the line of abdominal pain or minor trauma, this is a great drug for that. We give this medication like water in the emergency department and it works fantastic. It's got a quick onset, it lasts for quite a while, all right? And they can't have any contraindications. And then finally, just expect telehealth to ask for this drug quite a bit because it is the number one drug that they will request for you to give, okay? Just like everything else, this will be available to you February 1st. We'll take another brief second and take some questions, okay? Okay, last topic, 20 CRW. If you've never heard of this before, some of you have heard about it before. The Australian burn team had come through here a few months ago and uh, Chief Taylor, Chief Billiter and I had the opportunity to meet with the Australian team and learn about this incredible first aid technique that they use for burn care. It really is amazing, their national burn center uh, runs open with open beds all the time because every man, woman, child, dog, and cat 
knows about this in Australia and their burn care is second to none. And we, our fire department, has been invited into this by UC Davis and Shriners and we, our job in this is to figure out how to roll this out through the United States for an educational platform. So our fire department has been honored to be selected to be part of that process. So what is 20 CRW? Well, it is 20 minutes of cool running water, okay? Here's the whys. It reduces pain quickly. It reduces burn depth. It reduces the need for surgery and it promotes rapid healing. Let's talk about the burn depth. I like my steaks medium, but I take my steak off of the grill at medium rare. Why? Well, it's because as you know, the steak continues to cook even if it's off the grill. Human flesh does the same thing once it's been burned. It continues to cook deeper. And that's really important to remember because we wanna stop that cooking process as close to the burn as possible. That includes on the scene. So here's your patient selection criteria. Are they burned? Is the burn less than 30% total body surface area? And do they have no respiratory involvement? They can't have any respiratory involvement. The answer to those three questions is yes, a burn, yes, and less than 30%, no respiratory involvement. Think about cooling them. Okay, so the question is, is how? However you can. It can be a shower, a garden hose, it can be a sink, it can be anything that has cool running water out of it. How cool is cool? Cool. Like, I'm not gonna give you a temperature, but it shouldn't be warm or hot. So something that's cool, and the water does need to be running. The Australians were very specific about this. We had some conversations about the why. Don't submerse it in water. Don't put a, don't put a cloth, a cool cloth over it. Don't put ice over it. Don't put gels or salves over it. Nothing else. Just let water run over it. And what it does is it literally draws the heat out of the burn and stops the burning process. It works fantastic. Here's the key about the 20. It's 20 minutes cumulative. Our dispatch center has now moved the instructions for this to the top of their pre-arrival instructions. So when a patient calls and they're on the burn card, they say, I've been burned, our dispatch center is going to instruct them, if at all possible, to start cooling the burn. Get in a shower, get a hose running over it, get it under a sink, whatever it takes, and start cooling that process. That starts the clock. So if they get five minutes done before you get there, you only need to do it for another 15. Wait, doc, did you just say that we're gonna stay on scene and keep cooling this burn? That's exactly what I said. Remember, the faster we can cool this thing down, the less it cooks deeper, the faster the healing, the, the less the pain, the less need for grafting. This would also include you as well. If a firefighter unfortunately incurs a burn, there is better things you can do right there on scene to promote healing and to reduce the depth of the burn, if at all possible, as long as those three criteria are met. Burned, less than 30%, no respiratory involvement. If it's more than 30% or there's respiratory involvement, we're going. Just get going to the burn center and they will take care of it from there, okay? Couple questions that come up, hypothermia, like low, like what if it's like 25% and they're burned and we're cooling them down with water, do they get hypothermic? There is a risk of hypothermia, so we want you to cover them as much as you can to keep them warm. Try to keep them as warm as you can while you're cooling the burn. And what about infection? The risk of infection is extremely low. And even if there is a risk of infection, remember, that as this person blisters, they will have these blisters taken off and they'll have debridement of their burn, which reduces the infection risk. So the risk of infection is very small. Okay, last thing is a little bit about documentation. In our PCRs right now, there are selections under the event log, under treatment, that you'll see the drop down for 20 CRW, and it'll give you the key things you need to document, like the, the time prior to 911 arrival, to time prior to your arrival that the person was cooled, document the time on scene you gave it, and if you can't give it, document why as well, okay? All right, that concludes this one. We'll take a couple more questions and get you back to your rotation. Again, sorry I couldn't be with you there today, um, but if you're watching this after the MCD as well, this is a good refresher. Uh, so I hope that this helped. All right.
Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time.